Hi, everybody out there. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. It looks like the audio visual issues are working. So welcome to Wave Club. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Um, hi, everybody. It's 12 o'clock. Welcome to Wave Club. I think we'll wait one more moment because some people are coming in here. And then I'll introduce everybody. Hey, Earl. I, hey. I, I assumed you were too young to know I want to be your dog, but I was really impressed. Too young? How young do you think I am? <laughs> I don't know. You're not my age, I don't think. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, how you doing? Here, how's your basement? <laughs> how did you hear about that? You know, word gets around. <laughs> um, I don't know. We got the plumber here now. We have the water authority. So uh, whatever it is, is going to be expensive. <laughs> Sorry. All right, guys. I think it's time to get started. We have a good audience here for Wave Club. As fun as it would be to talk about Bard's uh, flooded basements <laughs> and any traveling waves that might be happening down there. Um, well, anyway, uh, my name is Josh Jacobs. Welcome to Wave Club. Uh, this is something that um, we've talked about uh, in my lab for a while. Uh, Wave Club, what we plan on for Wave Club is that this is going to be a monthly or so discussion group all about the topic of traveling waves. Um, uh, organized with Bard Ermintraud, who you can see in the bottom there, who's having some plumbing problems at his, at his house right now, uh, as well as with uh, Uma Mohan and Irfan Zabet. Irfan is sitting here next to me, and Uma, you can see on the screen there. Um, Wave Club is something that we, um, it's kind of related to this grant that Bard and I have from the National Science Foundation, which we're very helpful for their, uh, appreciative of their support. Um, and traveling waves, so the purpose of, of Wave Club is to discuss traveling waves. Um, traveling waves are a topic that um, I've discovered in my lab a number of years ago and other people have looked at for many decades, but over the last few years, they've been getting more and more attention. And I realized that in the last few years with this growing, um, with, with our ability to have meetings online, that it might be a nice opportunity to bring together this interdisciplinary community um, who's been looking at traveling waves across many, many species. Um, so hopefully you all can see my slides. And a few years ago, we realized in my lab that traveling waves are really all over the brain. They're not just a human, in my lab, we study human brain recordings, uh, direct human brain recordings from epilepsy patients. And we've realized that, that once you started looking for uh, not just brain oscillations at one individual site, like in many conventional studies, including my own, but if you start looking across the entire brain, you see that these waves are moving across the brain and they're actually traveling. And I thought this was really exciting. And it seems that the more we look for these waves, the more they are everywhere across the brain. And, I, and so that's why I became excited about this whole line of work. So. Um, we created Wave Club. Uh, this is the inaugural Wave Club, so thank you for your support. Um, we re created Wave Club with the following rationale in mind. Uh, brain oscillations have been studied for many decades, and we think that they might have wide-ranging implications for cognition and computation and other kinds of behaviors for telling us how different brain regions are, are interacting. But these are early days for traveling waves, so it seems like it would be important to understand this issue in a really broad, comprehensive way, because these same kinds of waves seem to be present across humans as well as animals, and not only um, with um, electrophysiology, but also fMRI studies and other kinds of methods as well. So it seems like this is a really 
uh, big and new things that I, I think could use a really broad um, kind of approach. And that's why I think it's useful to have this journal club, wave club, um, to bring together our community, especially because we're all gotten good at using Zoom meetings over the course of the pandemic. So uh, maybe we don't need to wait for SFN to start having this conversation or things like that. So the purpose of Wave Club, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, overview myself before turning to our main speaker today. Um, the goal of Wave Club, as myself and Bard and Uma and Irfan um, conceived of it, is to have an open discussion series on traveling waves in the brain. Everybody is welcome, the more the merrier to attend. The topics for uh, Wave Club is, is basically anything related to traveling waves in the brain of any animal, um, empirical, theoretical, any species, any modality. Um, there tend to be a lot of measurements of traveling waves with electrophysiology of, of brain oscillations, but you can also look at traveling waves with spiking, with fMRI signals, with uh, hemodynamic signals, with brain stimulation, uh, uh, optical recordings. Am I missing any, Irfan? No? He thinks I got them all. I'm sure there are more methods. But the goal is this is a really integrative, open sort of group, and that's our goal for this meeting. Uh, and to have these meetings about once a month, um, and well, I'll tell you the schedule for the next uh, few weeks going forward. Uh, just a moment about the logistics for today's meeting. Uh, the goal is to have about a 40-minute presentation from our speaker, Earl Miller. Uh, we want to have uh, a number of minutes at the end for questions to kind of make this as interactive as possible. And the way that we would like to do this um, is to use the Q&A. So if you have a question during the talk, um, the goal, what we, what we would like to do for now is to not have the questions interrupt our speaker, but instead to have you use the Q&A feature in Zoom to type in your questions. And at the end, Irfan and and uh, and, uh, and Uma and Bard and I will kind of moderate the questions and try and organize them. But what we'd like very much is to bring the pe people who have any questions on stage so that they can say their, their question aloud. Um, and we kind of have a discussion kind of um, informally from that. Um, every month, we're gonna have a different speaker. Um, today, our first speaker is gonna be um, uh, Earl Miller, but I wanted to just mention before I forget, we really encourage, we want this to be as open as possible. And if you're interested in speaking at Wave Club, please reach out to us over email or Twitter or whatever. Um, we, uh, you know, to, we want to have a, a range of perspectives on traveling waves um, represented here at this, at this meeting. Um, we want it to be an informal and fun sort of meeting. Um, so please just reach out. And if you have suggestions for how we might organize things better, uh, let me know. Or any of us, any of the organizers know. Um, today, our speaker is Earl Miller, who I will introduce in a moment. And we also are really um, excited to have two um, upcoming speakers for the next couple of months scheduled as well. On, in the May meeting on May 7th, um, Zach Davis is going to be giving a presentation. Zach is at the uh, University of Utah. And then in June, on June 4th, Laura Duget is going to be giving a talk on traveling waves as well. And these are their photos right here. Hopefully, you can see them. Um, and that brings us to the main event, which is Earl Miller, uh, Professor Earl Miller from MIT, who's going to give a talk today um, on cognition emerging from neural dynamics. And this is a photo of Earl. He's the Picower Professor of Neuroscience from MIT. Um, many of you might know Earl because uh, he's a, a world-renowned professor who's done um, very impactful work on the prefrontal uh, on memory and prefrontal cortex and all kinds of cognition uh, from single neuron recordings as well as traveling waves. Others of you might also know him uh, from his uh, track record of playing bass in the uh, band Pavlov's Dogs. Um, I, I know him from both of these, these such things, which is very fun for me. Um, and uh, that's about it. So I'm going to dive right in and uh, let Earl take it away from here. Uh, Irfan and Uma and Bard, did I miss any logistical things that are, might be important? No? OK. All right, well, thanks everyone for your attention in advance. I'm gonna um, let Earl share his screen and Earl, you can take it from there. Great. And Earl, Thank I'll you. keep an eye on, you just give your presentation. I'll keep an eye on the um, clock and the Q and A and all those things and let you all know right. speed up or anything like that, okay? So thanks again for coming. I appreciate well, it very much. So, um... Thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the inaugural Way Club. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more talks as, as, uh, later in, in the future. Uh, but for today, my name is Earl Miller, and um, my lab studies executive brain functions. We study things like planning, focusing attention, learning and following rules, organizing thoughts, and we study them using electrophysiology and computational modeling and, and analytics. Now, why do we do that? We want to understand how the brain works. We want to understand cognition, and hopefully one day our work will lead to understanding 
um, dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction diseases, so we can open up paths to treatment. Now, today I'm going to sort of give you an historic, almost like an historical perspective. First, I'm, I'm the first part of the talk. I'm going to make an um, an argument for why brain oscillations are important and functional. In the second half of the talk, move on to the topic of traveling waves per se. So, let's begin. We study the, our main focus of our lab's work is the prefrontal cortex and again, executive brain functions. And we know the prefrontal cortex is important for executive brain functions, which are planning behavior, monitoring ongoing behavior, and executing behavior and keeping it on track to direct it towards goals. And our hypothesis was that the major PFC function is to acquire and use top-down information, the rules of the game. When we started working on the um, prefrontal cortex nearly uh, 30 years ago, the main hypothesis was that it plays a role in working memory, which it does, but we thought its function is more broader. What it has to do is the prefrontal cortex and associated structures is the main part of their brain that learns how the world around us works so we can identify goals and go after them. So we've been employing newish technology in multiple electrode recording, and I say newish because when I was a graduate student, we used to record from the brain one electrode and one neuron at a time. And it's a very different world now. Now we're studying hundreds or thousands of neurons at a time and local field potentials, all from you know uh, these, these large arrays of multiple electrodes. And what this has allowed is an understanding of the brain that's different from the way we used to understand the brain in the 20th century. In the 20th century, we used to understand the brain or our approach was understanding the brain on its individual parts. What do individual neurons do? What do individual brain areas do? But now we're more focusing on the brain's emergent properties. That's properties and mechanisms that emerge only when the parts interact. They can't be seen on the level of individual parts. And I'll get to an example of that in a few minutes. But just to orient us, we're going to be talking about two different types of signals, spikes, which are impulses from single neurons, in other words, the individual voices of a very, very large crowd, and the local field potentials, which are the average activity of millions of neurons near each recording electrode, in other words, the roar of the local crowd. Now, starting about 25 years ago or more, we started to test this hypothesis that the prefrontal cortex does indeed absorb the rules of the game, top-down information. Now, I'm not going to walk you through all, all these studies because they're, 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 you know, they're old studies by now, um, but just to give you the bottom line, and that is we taught monkeys a wide variety of, of, uh, of new knowledge, of new ways of rules, like categorizing cats versus dogs or learning, recognizing small numbers, or even principles like same versus different and up versus down. And we, when we studied this in the single neuron level, uh, we found that the, indeed the prefrontal cortex is tuned by top-down information. The prefrontal cortex absorbs top-down information. Its neurons are actually less sensitive to sensory information. Their, their, their strongest signals their neurons give off are the ones that are tracking the rules and the principles needed to solve the task at hand, whether it's the category membership of an image or the what number it corresponds to or what rule the animal is following. And then we went on to show how the prefrontal cortex could use this top-down acquired information to control the flow of activity across cortex. And that led to a paper that John Fincone and I published uh, 23 years ago now, now, where we said the prefrontal cortex uses all this, all this top-down information, all this acquired knowledge to act like an orchestra conductor. It learns the score, then uses the score to then conduct the orchestra. In other words, control activity in the rest of cortex like a puppet master. Now, in doing these experiments, because we had multiple electrodes and because we were studying things like more complex behavioral paradigms than had been done previously, um, we found a new property that had been previously unreported, a property called mixed selectivity neurons. Now, we used to think back in the 20th century that cortical neurons are rel relatively simple and specialized for single functions. For the that's what we call this traditional selectivity. Under this traditional view, Neurons like, for example, neuron in the visual cortex might detect a single feature like an edge or a combination of a few features that all added up to the same thing. For example, you might have a neuron, neurons that detect things like red or um, color or form and motion for the concept of rolling ball, right? That meant the neurons, neurons all did one thing. But in doing these experiments, they had one function when neurons signal, they signal one thing only. But in doing these experiments, we found that neurons had something called mixed selectivity. 
These are neurons that did not fit, did fit this traditional role, role. They're neurons that were selected for complex, nonlinear combinations of many features with no obvious relation. You would find neurons in different contexts that will respond to completely different features of different of, of, uh, of stimuli or task demands. And I'll show you an example of that in, in, in a minute. And, but what this all added up to is that in many neurons of the cortex seem to be multifunctional. By having this ability to respond in a very complex way to a lot of different features of things, they could actually participate in many different functions. Now, why are these mixed selectivity neurons so important for top-down information and executive brain functions? Well, this was shown by uh, my colleague Stefano Fusi and Mattia Rigatti using data collected in my laboratory by Melissa Warden. And what they showed is they, they took this concept of mixed selectivity and made a computational model that showed exactly why mixed selectivity neurons are so important. What they are is they're mixed selectivity neurons or a neural bazaar where a wide range of information can be combined. This makes the brain smarter. The brain, the brain has all this information on its, at its fingertips. And it also it creates a high dimensional representational space that allows the brain to solve more complex problems. And because the information is distributed across many, many neurons instead of a few specialized neurons, it greatly increases the storage capacity of the brain. And all this leads to faster learning and cognitive flexibility, all the things you need for high level cognition. But, and here's where the, where the uh, emergent properties come in, mixed selectivity required a new way to think about the brain. Back in the 20th century, we used to think that every neuron had one function, as I mentioned, and anatomy is destiny. Neurons combine signals because they're wired together. Now, I've illustrated that here by showing two different thoughts here. We have our blue thought, we have our red thought. And the blue thought meant that there was a bu bunch of neurons that were hooked together um, by virtue of their anatomical connections. And this is a unique network, a unique ensemble that meant this particular thought. And another thought, we'll call it the red thought, might be another would, would be another ensemble, another collection of, of networks, and there they were these two thoughts had relatively separate ensembles. You can develop links between these ensembles if you learn that red and blue go together, but generally these these different thoughts, red and blue, were thought to be anatomically unique networks. The idea was that every perception, every thought, action had an anatomically unique net, network called an ensemble. But mixed selectivity means that neurons are members of multiple ensembles. So I've illustrated that here by drawing our two networks, our red and blue network, as overlapping, overlapping anatomy. And they share some common elements, these mixed selectivity neurons that are part of both the red network and the blue network. So this way we and so if this is true, if anatomy is destiny the way we used to think, how does this work? This is what mixed selectivity means. Neurons must participate in, in multiple ensembles, multiple networks. So how does this work? If I want to think the red thought, I might try to activate the red neurons, but then the activity would quickly run through the mixed selectivity multifunctional neurons, then activate the blue network. And now you have both ensembles activated and your brain is a mush of thoughts. So how does this work? Why don't all the networks activate one another and create a jumble of thoughts if anatomy was everything in the brain? Well, what many of us have come to realize, and I'm sure members of the Wave Club, is that a lot of stuff goes on at the level of the brain's emergent properties. Emergent properties are explainable not by individual part properties alone. And a great example of that is a sports uh, a crowd doing the Wave in a stadium. You can see the Wave here moving on the screen from um, left to right. Now these, you could study this whole you, you you could study this whole crowd one person at a time or back in the way we used to study the brain in the 20th century you can stick electrode to every neuron one at a time and you would never see the wave you would know in detail about what every person in this crowd is saying what every neuron is doing but you can't see the wave until you study all the neurons all the people in the crowd together as a whole that's an that's an emergent property now of course that's what neural oscillations are. Neural oscillations are an emergent property. They reflect the organization of millions of neurons. My guess is that when nervous systems became complex enough to naturally begin oscillating, as complex electrical networks will do, that's a natural form of organization. Neurons begin to oscillate organically. Then evolution found a way to push around those oscillations and exert control over neural computation. In other words, if a stadium crowd can self-organize with a few simple rules, Consider what your brain can achieve with this principle. 
And indeed, this kind of large scale organization is exactly what's needed for top down executive control. Goal directed behavior requires synchronizing and coordinating large numbers of neurons toward a specific function. If I want to make a decision, if I want to engage in some voluntary action, if I want to pay attention to a seminar speaker, I got to coordinate a whole bunch of neurons, millions of neurons all do the same thing, and oscillations are a great way of doing that. But also, there's something called representational drift. Individual neurons are notoriously fickle. If you record from a 100 neurons or 1,000 neurons and record a 100 or 1,000 identical trials, you'll get 100 or 1,000 different patterns of activity largely on the individual neuron level. Could ha what happens is individual neurons will fire a little bit, they'll give a burst of activity, they'll be quiet for a while, they'll give a burst of activity, they'll be quiet for a while. It's as if the cortex is like the world's largest orchestra and the song is playing on, but individual neurons play a short snippet of the song, then they're quiet for a while, then they come back and play a little more of the song, then they're quiet for a while. So if you want to control neural processing on the level of millions of neurons, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to control the individual players. They're too fickle. You want to control it on the level of the song. And when Dimitris Pernosis, uh, when he, uh, my colleague Dimitris Pernosis from University of College of London, we've been collaborating together for a while, and he showed in a paper published two years ago that if you look not at the level of individual neurons, but at the level of uh, just above the LFPs, the near electric fields given off by the brain that hover just above the level of the brain's LFPs, you can find you can read the contents of working memory from the electrical fields given off by the brain using intracranial electrodes. So I can read the contents from these electric fields. What's the big deal? I can also read them at the level of individual neurons if I amass enough neurons. Well, the difference is, is that individual neurons are fickle, and at the level of electric fields, there is little or no representational drift. You get a pure signal that's steady, steady, steady. It no, no drift at all. Doesn't that sound useful to have a signal that's, that's, pure, that's pure and steady and robust? Well, important thing, it's not just useful for measuring the brain, for looking at, for us neurophysiologists to figure out how the brain works. The brain can also use this because there's something called a fact of coupling. A fact of coupling means electrical fields in the brain have a causative influence. Electrical fields influence electric fields, which then influence the underlying activity. So in other words, synchronous oscillatory activity from neurons create localized electric fields. And then in turn, in other words, the spikes generate these electric fields. And then the electric fields turn around and entrain neural activity through this process of effect of coupling. In other words, the electric fields themselves can sculpt the underlying neural, neural activity. And this is a couple examples from our laboratory, but if you go do a Google search, Google Scholar search on effect of coupling, you will see thousands of papers on effect of coupling. So it's a real phenomenon in, in, in the brain, and it must have an influence. This is a simple, basic electromagnetic magnetic theory. The electrical fields, in, it's a two-way influence from the spikes up to the fields and the other way back down again. And Demetrius also went on to propose something called cytoelectric coupling. He amassed some evidence suggesting that these electric fields, these fluctuating electric fields, can actually not only control brain processing level of millions of neurons, they can actually restructure the brain on the molecular level, shoving around pr structural proteins on the molecular level, fine-tuning networks to process information more efficiently. This is uh, suggested here on the left here, where if you put a bunch of grains of sand on a speaker and play a sound, the grains of sand will organize themselves. And that's the idea. These fluctuating electric fields can actually organize the underlying structural proteins on the molecular level, fine-tuning them to make them oscillate more efficiently. And since the oscillations are carrying information, it's a way for information the brain is processing to actually fine-tune the brain, to restructure the brain on the network level to fine-tune it. So the way to think about this is brain anatomy is kind of like the road and highway system. Anatomy is not destiny. Anatomy is like the road and highway system. It just says we're trafficked could go, but it's oscillatory dynamics that help direct the traffic. And that's what your thoughts are. Your thoughts are where the traffic is flowing on this highway system from moment to moment. And that's what we think these oscillations do. And the example of this came from Tim Bushman, who's now a professor at Princeton. When he was in the laboratory, he conducted a study where he had monkeys switch back and forth between two different rules they were solving, two different, two tasks that were identical except for which rule was being applied. And what he found was shown here on the left, this is a representation of the monkey's lateral prefrontal cortex. It would be here on the side of my head. Uh, this is the principal sulcus and the arcuate sulcus for you anatomy aficionados. 
And what these circles show are recording sites where we had electrode arrays, electrodes in, in our electrode arrays. And the colored lines show recording sites that showed a significant increase in LFP synchrony, LFP coherence, whenever the animal was following one rule on the left versus another rule on the right. And what you see is there's some overlap, but there's two unique patterns of oscillatory synchrony when the animal is following one rule versus the other rule. This, these LFP um, synchrony between the different recording sites, suggesting that this synchrony has helped forming ensembles for one rule versus the other rule. Now we look for these effects across all range of frequencies from, from one hertz up to 100 hertz. And we found them primarily in the beta range, about 12 to 25 hertz. Sometimes they dip down into the alpha range, as you'll see in a, in a few minutes, but primarily centered on the beta range. These, we found that, and we looked across a variety of studies done. We, we trained animals on, on more tasks. We looked over old data. Every time we looked for top-down information in the brain, we found the same effect, these unique patterns of beta, alpha, beta synchrony. Uh, that was unique for different types of top-down information, different rules the animal was solving. So with that in mind, let's turn to the topic of, of working memory. Working memory is the holding of information in mind. It is one of the basic, most fundamental cognitive functions. Working memory isn't just short-term memory. It's volitional control over working memory. You can, Because of working memory, you can control what you think about. So top-down control is everything for working memory. When Michael Lundvist came to the laboratory, he did something unique. He decided to test a computational model that he developed. And what he did is he looked at data we already had in the laboratory to test the model. And he, he studied a task where monkeys were trained to hold two pictures in working memory, in mind simultaneously. And what Michael did was something unique. He looked at most history of neurophysiology is averaging across multiple trials. You have 20 trials of the same condition, you average across them. And the idea was that by averaging, you factor out the noise and you boost the signal. But what if some of that noise wasn't noise at all? What if it's real processing the brain is doing? So what Michael did is he looked at neural activity in real time. And what he found is unlike the classic story that was actually an artifact of averaging, working memory isn't just simple sustained activity, like turning on and off a light bulb. It's actually the activity underlying working memory is very sparse and bursty and oscillatory. So it's shown here is an example of a single trial. This is from a single trial of a, um, activity recorded from the lateral prefrontal cortex of, of a monkey. Time is on the x-axis. Here's where the first stimulus was presented. There's a gap in time. Here's where the second stimulus was presented. Then here's the working memory delay where the monkey's holding both pictures uh, in working memory. So on the y-axis is the frequency of, of LFP and power is shown by the color. So what Michael found is that the information about the stimuli the monkey was holding in working memory was carried by spiking, but that spiking was co-localized in space and time with bursts of gamma. So you see these bursts of gamma that happen when the stimulus is presented, then happen periodically over the memory delay. All the information about the, spi about the stimuli the monkey was holding in working memory were co-localizing with these gamma bursts. So bursts of Spiking and gamma carry the contents of working memory. But we also found these, these bursts of gamma alternated with bursts of beta. You can see, see that here. Here's a couple beta bursts, lower frequency beta bursts. They are occurring when the gamma is not occurring. And you can see that here. This is now average across multiple trials. This is the beta gamma burst rate on the top in the, uh, in the, in the reddish uh, color. And on the bottom is the beta burst rate in the brownish color average across trials. Now, if you look at gamma for a moment, what you see in gamma is the exact same thing you saw in the uh, neuron literature for decades, since 1971, since Fuster discovered this phenomenon of, of delay activity in working memory. You see that gamma goes up when the stimuli are presented um, briefly. And over the working memory delay, they, it dips down a bit and ramps up over the delay. You've seen this a thousand or tens of thousands of times in studies of, of spiking of working memory. So gamma is tracking exactly what spikes are doing, um, at least the spikes that are carrying the stimulus information. 
But beta, notice that beta is doing the exact opposite of what a gamma is doing. Whenever gamma goes up, beta goes down. Whenever beta goes up, gamma goes down. So beta and gamma are anti-correlated. Now, we, if gamma is carrying the bottom-up information, the sensory signals, the, the contents of working memory, the stimuli the animal is holding in working memory, we, we know that beta is carrying the top-down information, the acquired knowledge of the rules, as I told you just a few minute, minutes ago. So gamma is carrying, signaling, helping signal bottom-up, and beta is carrying top-down. And what we think this means is that top-down control happens by beta rhythms. Beta rhythms are like top-down inhibitory control signals that reduce bottom-up gamma and spiking wherever it lands in cortex. So beta is like this control signal that if you want to have more gamma, more spiking, like these responses to the sensory stimuli, you drive beta down, that allows gamma and spiking to occur. If you want to decrease gamma and spiking, you drive up beta. And then if you want to let gamma ramp up, you drive down beta. Beta is the inhibitory control signal, a gatekeeping mechanism for gamma and spiking and bottom-up signaling. So in other words, we, 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 we uh, recently formalized this in a model that we call spatial computing. And the idea behind spatial computing is that beta rhythms selectively inhibit patches of cortex. And this allows the brain to control just the right neurons at the right time to do the right things. In other words, beta patterns are like a stencil. Beta patterns are these inhibitory patterns that form a stencil. And the beta rhythm is selecting inhibit physical patches of cortex. And this controls which neurons can be activated by the gamma bottom-up signals. To carry this analogy to, to the cartoon level, beta is like a, a stencil that inhibits patches of cortex. And gamma is like a, 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 spray, a spray paint that, that um, de then determines which, which of these um, patterns in, in the uh, in the stencil get 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 activated okay now in other words spatial computing is an update to our earlier model the Miller and Cohn model I, I mentioned earlier that model was based on spiking only we thought all the top-down control was happening by spikes in the prefrontal cortex signaling signaling through anatomical connections back to sensory cortex and activating different sets of neurons in, in, in posterior sensory cortex. That's the way we thought of it 23 years ago. Now we're thinking it's the same general idea, but it adds the inhibitory influences of these beta patterns, of beta waves. Okay, so let me give you an example of what this is like just to make it more concrete. Remember I mentioned these property of mixed selectivity, these neurons that respond to nonlinear combinations of, of things, of task demands and objects and features and stuff like that. So let's take an example of that. Here's a sequence memory task. And the idea is the animal, you show the animal two pictures in a row. Could be the padlock and the butterfly, or it could be the butterfly and the padlock. And the animal has to remember both pictures and the order in which they appeared. Now, if you record in the prefrontal cortex or in other cortical areas, you'll find neurons in mixed selectivity. In fact, this is the data that led to the original mixed selectivity paper um, in 2013. And what mixed selectivity is, you'll find neurons that will, for example, only respond to the padlock and only respond when it's the first stimulus, or only respond to the padlock, but only when it's the second stimulus. Or you'll find other things like the butterfly, neurons that will respond only to the butterfly when it's second, or only to the butterfly when it's first. Or you'll find neurons that will only respond to the butterfly when it's first and the, butter, and the um, padlock when it's second, for example. All sorts of combinations you can imagine. So the way this works, well, first of all, mix, what this means is that mixed selectivity neurons have all the information needed to solve the test. They have information about the objects and the order in which they appeared, which is the top-down information needed to solve the task. So the way we think this works is that Here's what represents the same patch of cortex, and stimulus selectivity is determined by just random bottom-up excitatory connectivity. So you have a bunch of neurons in this patch of cortex that will respond to the padlock, and then a bunch of neurons in the same patch of cortex that will respond to the butterfly, and some neurons can respond to both. There is some overlap. What beta does, beta is a top-down signal, a spatially structured signal that reflects the top-down demands of the task. So the first stimulus comes along, let's say it's the padlock. First stimulus comes along and let's say, let's say it's the padlock. And there's a, a, a beta signal, an inhibitory signal that corresponds to that operation, the first stimulus. And this beta signal inhibits 
part of that patch of cortex, and thus on the other part of the patch of cortex that's not affected by beta, neurons will respond to the padlock. But because of this beta signal, these neurons will only respond to the padlock when the, that padlock is presented first. Now, the second stimulus comes along, second stimulus comes along, and it's the butterfly. And now the beta signal is now inhibiting another patch of cortex, a different patch of cortex that corresponds to the operation of second object. And now this other patch of cortex is being inhibited. So now you have neurons over here and that will only respond to the butterfly and only respond when it's, when it's second. And of course, the beta patterns stay the same. The first, the, the patch for the first object is always the same and the patch for the second object is always the same, but the objects can be changed around. So if you present the butterfly first and the padlock second, you will get neurons here that will only respond to the butterfly when it's first, and neurons here that only respond to the padlock when it's second. That's mixed selectivity. It's how the brain uses these top-down patterns to control neurons that respond to all combinations of task features, have all the information needed to solve the task at hand. Okay, so in other words, being that gamma oscillations feed forward bottom-up sensory signals from sensory cortex to the front of the brain to the prefrontal cortex, and these beta, alpha beta oscillations are carrying the feedback signals that suppress gamma and thereby control neural computation, as I just showed you. Now, we, we originally did these studies in the prefrontal cortex alone, but then we found that we looked across all layers of cortex, and we found that actually, uh, because we wanted to look at how, how, these, uh, how these rhythms play out, uh, how they form in local circuits, and we found that the, um, there, was a, there was a layer difference. The, bot the bottom-up um, gamma oscillations were mainly carried in the superficial layers of cortex, and these are the feed-forward layers of cortex, and that makes sense because they're the ones that are, again, feed-forwarding signals from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. And while the beta oscillations are, were mainly in the deep layer of cortex. And that makes sense because the deep layers of cortex are the one that feedback signals in the opposite direction from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. And what we found is that this is not important for prefrontal cortex of working memory. I'll just mention this quickly. So we recently found, and this is a heroic study that Diego Mendoza Holiday and from Desmond Lab and Alex Major in my lab did, is they looked all over um, every cortical, looked in 14 cortical areas in macaques. They looked at different species. They looked at um, macaques, um, mice, humans, marmosets, and they found that this laminar motif is present everywhere. This is illustrated here on these figures by showing the, um, this is the um, gamma power in red and the beta power in blue. Zero is the middle layer of cortex, and what it shows is that beta is stronger in the deep layers of cortex, and gamma is stronger in the superficial layers of cortex. But we found that everywhere we looked in cortex and across different species. And not only that, we found this effect is so robust, you can find the middle layer of cortex just by finding the crossover in alpha and gamma and alpha beta power. And when you see an effect that's this ubiquitous and robust, you know it doing, it's doing something very important. Okay, now, of course, this is the wave club. So we found these oscillatory dynamics, of course, organize themselves into traveling waves. It actually doesn't make a lot of sense for all these waves we're talking about to, to be a jump rope, just going up and down, st standing wave in cortex, going up and down like a jump rope, because it means whole networks would activate and deactivate. Rather, these control signals, we look, looking, examining traveling waves, we find these traveling waves are mainly occurring in the lower frequencies, both beta and below, the frequencies we're associating with top-down control. And what traveling waves mean is now we have a very precise way of controlling activation in cortex. It isn't like, like blasting a wave at a patch of cortex. You move the wave around, and now you have precise control over, uh, over network activity. So here's an example of a traveling wave in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, this is a, shows an electrode array. Each square is a different electrode, and the voltage is, is on the uh, on, shown by power. And you see this wave is this is in real time. It's not average in any way. The wave is rotating around around the around the prefrontal cortex. And we found indeed that these waves are highly organized. They're like the sports fan in, in sports fans in the stadium. These waves, traveling waves don't bounce around like ping pong balls randomly hitting one another. They're highly organized. They move in certain directions and they only move in those directions. And when you see that kind of organization, you immediately think function. Things that organize in the brain, when things are organized in the brain, it shows it's it's highly suggestive of a, of a, of a function. 
So this, this is an example of the lateral prefrontal cortex of a monkey performing a working memory task. And we found that waves in this one subject during this working memory task traveled back and forth in two principal directions in this dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior axis. Um, dorsal on the top, ventral on the bottom, posterior on the right, anterior on the left. We found that the waves actually change with cognitive demand. So here's an animal performing a working memory task. Time is on the, on the um, x-axis. The two directions, one way or another, are on the, on the y-axis. Um, the waves moving equally in both directions uh, is in the middle. Uh, I'll spare the details of the task, but the important thing is that when the animal is waiting for the task to begin, these two waves are moving back and forth bidirectionally across the surface of the prefrontal cortex. Then the moment the task begins, the waves become highly unidirectional, and it maintains that way till the end of the trial when the task ends, and they go back to being more bidirectional. So these waves are highly organized, and they change around with cognitive demands. But what could these waves be doing? Well, a very recent study uh, just submitted for publication by uh, Tamal Badabayo in my lab shows that, uh, that there's a, a, a direct correspondence between traveling waves across the surface of cortex and spiking patterns in subspace coding. Now, just in case you're not familiar with sub not subspace coding, subspace coding is not on the LFP level, it's on the spiking level. And what subspace coding is, is you take it, if you record from a thousand neurons simultaneously, you can create a thousand dimensional space to create, to, re, to describe your spiking activity. Of course you can, that's what you can do with it. But then you ask the question, how many dimensions do you actually need to explain these spiking patterns? And the answer is three or four. What that means is a lot of dimensionality reduction in spiking activity. Subspace coding means that spiking patterns in cortex can be explained with just a few dimensions. In other words, spiking in cortex isn't like a bunch of highly complex spikes going off in a crazy way. Rather, neural, neural spiking in cortex is highly coordinated, like birds flocking in the sky. They move around the sky together and they, move, and they, they change direction in a highly coordinated way. Well, we, what, what we found is this coordination in subspace, there's a direct, a direct correspondence between the changing patterns of spiking in subspace and movements of rotating traveling waves across the, across the surface of cortex. And we believe that because of fact of coupling, electric uh, fields have a cause of influence, that means these traveling waves can actually organize these spiking patterns, and that suggests that traveling waves play a role in controlling and maybe even performing neural computation. So last thing I'll tell you about is our, our, uh, our studies of the role of uh, general anesthesia because we were interested in cognition and executive brain functions. Well, cognition and consciousness are highly associated. And it may be disturbing to know, but medical doctors don't really know why anesthesia causes you to lose consciousness. What they, what they know is that it works. And there's been this tacit assumption that anesthesia just maybe turns off your brain or turns off your cortex. Well, anesthesia doesn't do that. It actually dramatically changes the oscillatory patterns in the traveling waves in your cortex. So here's what the brain looks like in the awake state. This is real-time recordings and LFPs from four different cortical areas, the uh, frontal cortex, frontal eye fields, prefrontal cortex, posterior parietal cortex, and the STG or the auditory cortex. These are all LFPs recorded in real time. And here's spiking rec activity recorded from those LFPs. And what you see in the awake state is a lot of high frequency FM radio chatter, we'll call it, because waves are forming, they're moving around, computation is happening, there's ensembles forming, they're breaking apart and forming new ensembles. So a lot of high frequency chatter. Then we anesthetize the animal with a common anesthetic, a, a GABA acting anesthetic called propofol. And all these high frequency chatter we associated with, with um, cognition and cognitive control, it's all gone and replaced by a low frequency delta one hertz hum. You see that here in the LFPs now, there's this low frequency humming and the spiking activity in cortex becomes strongly entrained to those, that, th those one hertz delta hum. But it's not just a matter, so it seems like con loss of consciousness happens when general anesthetics um, basically swamp your brain with this low frequency signal and then that destroys or disrupts or, or swamps all the high frequency um, FM radio chatter. But it doesn't just do that, it also alters the traveling waves. So you see here, you can kind of see a hint of this here, is here we see the, the spiking activity is highly entrained to the delta waves, but notice that across areas, you get this misalignment between these, uh, between these um, 
spiking patterns, these misalignments between the traveling waves. And what we found is that the general anesthesia, general anesthetics don't just make your brain go into low frequency hum, they also scramble the phase alignment of the low frequency oscillations. So here's a study, just brand new study conducted by Alexandra Barden in the laboratory. And what she studied is, I just showed you the effects of propofol. In this particular study, we used anesthetic doses of ketamine and dexmedetomidine. Now, ketamine and dexmedetomidine, they activate, they act on different receptors in the brain in different parts of the brain. And just as a preview, we've also, we're also finding these same effects for propofol, which is a GABA, we acts on GABA receptors, and that's a completely other part of the brain. So that propofol data is forthcoming, but for this new paper, we showed this for both ketamine and dextentomidine, even though they have different actions and different, different receptors in different parts of the brain, you see nearly identical effects um, when, when you use anesthetic doses. That is, it scrambles the phase alignment of the low frequency oscillations. Everything below, um, beta and below, the within hemisphere um, LFPs become, become antiphase. They go from being fairly aligned to becoming anti-aligned. They, they flip around. And the across hemisphere, between the right and left hemisphere, why they generally have some phase offset, they, they become more phase aligned as a, as a result of uh, these an anesthetics. So the anesthetics are producing changes in phase alignment in, on, the, on these lower frequency brain waves that's very different from the awake state. Now, let me emphasize here that despite these different molecular actions on different neurons, these different drugs alter brainwave alignment in the, they produce the same thing, these low frequency waves, and they alter brainwave alignment in the same way. I could show you this data from these different drugs and you, you would have a difficult time telling them apart. So what does that mean? It means changes in brain waves can explain a phenomenon, the convergent effects of different anesthetics. Um, different anesthetics act on different parts of the brain from molecules, but they all do the same thing. They make you unconscious. So you can't explain these convergent effects of anesthetics on this more reductionistic level, but you can explain it by, by looking at brain waves and traveling waves. And I think that's a strong argument for these brain waves and traveling waves being truly functional in the brain. So I'm running short on time, so I'll just close you with just a quick overview that um, we're also addressing the issue of how the brain manages to maintain information between these moving bouts of activity, because these moving bouts of act traveling waves mean that there's times where neurons are silent. And we're, we, what we find is that short-term synaptic plasticity helps carry information between bouts of spiking, between, between traveling of the waves. And these also makes networks in your brain work better. They make them more robust to noise, more robust to degradation, help stabilize networks so neural activity doesn't run wild. That's a whole line of investigation I'd be happy to tell you about some other time. But in closing, I'll argue that cognition emerges from neural dynamics. The neural activity underlying cognition is not smooth or steady state. It's complex, dynamic, and rhythmic. There are emergent properties like oscillations and traveling waves, and this is providing new insights into mechanisms and function. Namely, the, main, the specific take-home message from this talk is lower frequency alpha beta waves are the top-down control signals. They, they control the higher frequency gamma waves and spiking that carry the contents of thought. And this is a general cortical motif that we've seen at play literally all over cortex and across species and thus plays a central role to cortical functions, not just working memory, but virtually everything the cortex does, attention, predictive coding, perception, et cetera. So I thank you for your attention. And mainly, I thank the students in my laboratory who all do the, uh, and postdocs who all do the uh, important hard work in making the, science, making the science happen. Thank you very much. Uh, Earl, that was wonderful. Thanks so much. I don't know if people could see me um, on my camera or not, but if anybody was lip reading, I was turning to Irfan and saying, wow, I should read that paper. That sounds really exciting. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, I think cool. the best thing would be if you want to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A feed. And I believe Uma, um, our co-organizer here, is going to handle the Q&A for everything. Do you want to unshare my screen for me? Oh, yeah. Let me... Let me uh, uh, I don't know how to unshare your screen. This is kind of fun to watch your rock band, but uh, <laughs> how do we unshare your screen? How do we unshare? How do you, my, I can't get the, at the button. That's the weird part. You share. Yeah, I can share my screen for a second. Yeah, do that. Uh, sounds good. How many PhDs does it take to figure out Zoom? 
Um, so in the meantime, uh, we have a really, we, we have a good set of questions in here. Um, if you're comfortable uh, coming up and asking, I'll put you, um, I'll put you as a panelist temporarily. Um, so our first question is from Zachary Davis. Um, are you okay with me putting you up as a panelist temporarily? And just while we get set up, I wanted to mention to everybody that we um, have recorded this and we plan on putting it online. So if you want to check out some of the citations or or whatever later, it'll all be there. Oh, hey, I've been promoted. Oh, great. Uh, hey, hello. Thanks, Earl. This was really wonderful. Uh, so just to be quick, my question is basically, so I agree that a haptic coupling clearly can play uh, a mechanistic role in, in regulating spike timing and the generation of spikes. But the, the question I have is a little bit more difficult. So how, how are we able to dissociate what is due to the contribution of the electrical field from the synaptic inputs that are also having a causal effect on spiking, but also give rise to those same electrical fields? Well, I think it's, um, people often say things like, oh, what the different functions of spike versus LFPs. Spikes and LFPs and also they're the same phenomenon, just at different levels of approximation. So I think it's it's not useful to think about how what they're doing to functionally separate them. They're, they're the same thing. Um, I will say that you know, um, that um, you know it's hard to do that in the hard to separate the influences of both in the intact brain because the intact brain everything's working. But this has been done in slice level, you know, where you can actually get more better control. But you know the way we um, we do this in our studies in the intact brains. We use computational modeling to model the signals and see what 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 the influ influences are. I will say we have a new paper uh, coming out with Jose Principe, where they ask the question. So, problem, everybody kind of assumes that you know that the way it happens is spiking happens and it creates the oscillation. The oscillation turn around and influence spiking, but it's really not that simple. So what this new paper shows is that we're looking at sensory cortex and you have a stimulus come up, a visual stimulus. And the way people most uh, way most people assume it happens is that the neurons start spiking to the stimulus, and then the, it creates gamma oscillations. What actually happens is the gamma oscill power goes up first, and then the neurons start spiking. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because so as soon as the neurons in your retina start spiking your, or your LGN, that's going to start creating electric fields, right? Well, synapses, action potentials take time to propagate because that's the go across synapses and chemical transmission across the synapse is slow. But electric fields spread influences at pretty much the speed of light, which is another reason why it makes them so useful for, for brain function. So what seems to be happening is that the spiking starts creating these electric fields very early in, in the response. Then the gamma sort of races ahead of the spiking, warming up cortex for the spiking when it, when it finally ca catches up. So that's even just simple bottom-up sensory processing. Then after that, everything beyond the initial sensory input is all about back and forth, you know, back and forth, feedback, feed forward. And that's where the oscillations are really playing an even stronger role. Yeah, great. I think that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, next we have a couple of questions from, um, we have two questions from Renu Sebastian. So I'm gonna, um, uh, Put them up really quickly to ask in person. Well, in person. <laughs> Close enough. Okay. Hi, all. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for bringing all, all the different concepts of like emphatic coupling and electric field. Um, spike and neural oscillations together. I was just wondering, one of the uh, data that you showed during your presentation, you showed the somewhat like a alluded to the antagonistic nature of beta and gamma, even before like going into the uh, laminar motif concept. So I was wondering, like, how did you collect that data? Was it like collected um, using a UTA array or was it collected using a linear mic um, microelectrode array? And then you collapsed uh, across the channels? Oh yeah, oh, sorry, I went through that quickly. So a lot of the alpha, beta, gamma studies you've done were done with UTRA arrays. Mm -hmm. And then to study the laminar um, profile, we use them um, um, laminar electrodes where they have multiple contacts along the shaft. So you can record from all layers of 
cortex uh, simultaneously. So I, I breezed through that quickly. Sorry about that. But yeah, in order to study the layer uh, thing, you have to use particular electrodes that allow you to uh, have multiple contacts so you can get all the layers simultaneously. Yeah, so uh, with, with the Utah arrays, it's mostly like sampling layer five um, and then this nature of antagonistic nature of like beta and gamma is like mostly in layer five or? Well, yeah. beta and gamma are both, they're, they're both in a, they're both in superficial deep layers of cortex. It's not a strict segregation mm -hmm. that one is stronger, gamma is stronger in the superficial layers and beta is stronger in the deep layers. So you can, you can, you can detect them in both layers and, and study them in both layers. But you're right, when you put a Utah array in cortex, you don't really know which layer you're in. You probably are in layer like four or, or five, given the, given the, uh, um, length of the of the uh, electrode arrays so you're probably right in the middle middle layers of cortex so you're probably sampling both both layers both superficial and deep layers really sure. but in order thank to address that directly you really need those laminar those laminar electrodes okay. thank you so much for the talk thank you um thank you for those really great questions i'm gonna move on to a question from martin lee um and I'll promote you to a panelist for the recording. Hello. Um, yeah, I was, you mostly talked about cortical areas, which I think is where your research is coming from. But um, I was thinking kind of what do you think are the subcortical effects on the gamma and beta oscillations? Because the amygdala seems like a really prime candidate for investigating the effects of traveling waves and also the cerebellum. So I just wanted to put that out there and ask. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I talked mainly about cortex. That's was the main topic of our our, our um, experiments. But yeah, you see these things in uh, in subcortex. See, I was just talking to Gary Lynch, for example, and he's studying uh, hippocampus, and he finds a he found very something very similar in hippocampus where alpha beta is controlling the routing of gamma across different different. Um, um, pathways in the hippocampus. So, in fact, almost directly analogous. And that makes sense because what with the cortex is kind of an add-on to subcortex. Your cortex evolved to add functionality to all these um, subcortical structures. But just to men mention, you know, the, the, these lower frequencies, the alpha beta, they may actually have a source, they may actually come from largely from the thalamus through these recurrent loops in the thalam thalamus and, and cortex. And I, there's work by Sabine Kastner showing that low frequency um, waves in, in uh, um, oscillations in cortex are entrained by, by, thalam by thalamic nuclei. And you know, there are other evidence that the anterior thalamic nuclei are, are, are help play a role in feeding back information from frontal cortex to um, posterior cortex. So yeah, you raise an excellent point. Um, and indeed, the subcortical structure is very important. And in general, we really can't understand the cortex without also understanding the subcortex too. So the lower frequencies seem to be uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, this alpha, beta, gamma trade-off also seems to happen in, uh, in subcortical areas. And the subcortical areas like the thalamus are a major contributor of the low frequency oscillations, the cortex. Um, that's really great. Um, I think Josh actually has a question. Yeah, I had a question for you, Earl. Um, you made a comment at the beginning of the talk about the idea that unlike neuron, you're comparing, you're talking about representational, uh, representational drift and unlike neurons, which, which drift, fields do not drift. I think that's the gist of what you were saying, which I thought was really thought provoking. And I was thinking about the fact, so, but, but it does, but, if that is true, what you're saying, I think it has some implications for like the spatial organization of the neurons that have certain functional properties. Is that right? Is that my thinking about it the right way? Um, well, if you record from a bunch of neurons and extract information from them, you wouldn't need to necessarily have a, a tight functional organization, a mapping of these neurons in order to pull the information out. It's the same sort of thing with, uh, with um, waves, right? Oscillations, S same difference. I mean, you don't need a, I think you're talking about topography, functional topography, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need functional topography, you just need, just need consistency. I mean, the brain organizes its, itself based on uh, learning. Oh, yeah. So, Right, no, that's what I mean. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. no, go ahead. What, what were you going to say? Well, I was just saying, I, I didn't have in mind the particular topography, but it just needs to be that whatever the topography is needs to be consistent, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's what um, a learning and memory does. You acquire all this top-down knowledge. It's programming your brain in certain ways that reflects this top-down knowledge. And if you don't have some consistency based on this, you know, self-training, 
uh, the, uh, then uh, you have nothing in the brain. It's, you, have, you have chaos. So the fact that the waves are conserved across across drifting means that there is a topography. That, that the hypothesis is that there's a topography that is maintained. There's some functional topography. Um, topography is not a simple um, like like a map of the retina or something, but but yes, and the fact that the waves move in a very characteristic way, they don't bounce around, but they actually travel in very specific directions, shows you there is some sort of functional topography going on there. Thank you, cool. Uma. You want to take a couple more questions? Yeah, um, that's super cool. I'm gonna. Um, there's a really great question from Lee Hao. I'm gonna um, put them up as a panelist now. Uh, we hire, hire Hello? Hi, Professor. Hi, Professor. Hello. Thank you for the great presentation. So in the presentation, you mentioned the different alpha, beta, gamma oscillations. And I think that's based on the LFP power. Have you considered the, the uh, frequency of the traveling waves? And uh, do you think that it will have a similar role as this LF, um, power frequencies? Oh yeah, what's what's great about so first of all, we don't see much in the way of traveling waves on, on the higher frequencies. That may be a measurement issue. We mainly see them in the low lower frequencies. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they're easier to detect, or maybe they're more phenomenon of the lower control frequencies. But what's interesting about traveling waves is that you know just by their existence, just by the fact that the waves moving across cortex, it automatically gives information to to networks about um, uh, lapse time and recent, net, recent patterns of network activity. Just like if you take a video of a um, pond and you drop four pebbles in the pond one at a time, and then you take a still picture from that video, you can tell me where the pebbles are dropped and how long ago they dropped, right? So yeah. that's a, just the existence of traveling is, gives, gives the brain that. But what's really cool is that different frequency traveling waves, they travel, they, they're, they're, they propagate at a speed that, that's directly related to their frequency. So delta waves travel slower than alpha waves, and alpha waves travel slower than beta waves. And what that means is that just by knowing the frequency of the traveling wave and watching, you, you have automatically have a way of keeping track of elapsed time in the uh, brain and recent network activity. So they're, 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 they're not like, you know, like I said, like ping pong balls bouncing around. They travel in very specific ways, and they even propagate at very specific frequencies dependent on, 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 the, on, the, um, on the frequency of the traveling wave. So they're, very, they're giving a very, they're giving very useful information to the brain. Mm -hmm. so how about the amplitude of the traveling waves? Do you find any correlation between the amplitudes versus, say, the frequency or maybe the some any other factors? We haven't looked at so much of the uh, um, haven't seen much in the amplitude per, per se, just mainly in, in yeah. where they travel and the frequency of travel. But you know, there's always more things to look at. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for that, uh, that great question. Um, Bar, did you have, also have a question next? Me? No, no, I, I, no, I didn't. I had made some comments to somebody else. I, I did want to make a comment about waves here and, and maybe making the distinction between kind of what I would call trigger waves which are like the waves that propagate along an action potential in a nerve axon and phase waves, which are, I think, largely what Earl's talking about, yeah. which arise when when there's phase differences between oscillators. And of course, mm -hmm. if, if you maintain a constant phase difference, but you change the frequency, you naturally get a linear change in velocity as well. So I don't know whether that's related to um, Earl's issues of velocity. Yeah, yeah and stuff and because it's not i don't think it's strictly like regular old dispersive waves but um i just wanted to make that distinction and, and people get confused i think a lot about phase waves versus actual material waves propagating mm -hmm. and, and you can have arbitrarily high speeds of waves propagating in phase simply because their timing differences are very small and so yeah a good point. I mean, the brain, is, the brain is this nest of all these waves acting in different ways. Um, not much of a surprise why the brain, brain's created music, huh? That's a really important distinction. Um, I'm going to, uh, we'll do a, a couple more questions before wrapping up. Um, I know we're a little over time. Um, I'm going to 
take a question from Cameron Holman. Um, let me put you up as a panelist really quickly. Um, hey, Earl, great talk. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's really a question about the directionality of effect with anesthetics. Like, mm -hmm. what, what's the low frequency power that you see during the awake state relative to the, anest the anesthetized state? Like, are we seeing the low frequency one hertz hum get much stronger and thus yes. overshadow everything else and entrain all of the spiking? Or is it a reduction in the high frequency? That... Uh, well, both, actually. It's a, it's a decrease in higher frequencies. And in, the delta waves, they're there in the awake state, just that they're part yeah. of the, this underlying morass of all these uh, different frequencies going yeah. on. Then they become super prominent during, during an, anesthesia. Um, okay. And the lower frequencies, it's hard to, t you know, and the lower higher frequencies lose power um you know and it's uh it, it's funny because um we studied three different anesthetics of our propofol dexmedetomidine and ketamine and they all do the same thing i mean the exact same thing ketamine low doses of ketamine is associated with um non-anesthetic doses have been used as a way of um a, like a therapy for depression recently and at low right. doses you get an in increase in high frequencies gamma with, with ketamine Mm -hmm. But then you give a anesthetic dose of ketamine, um, to, and it, just like other anesthetics, it increases these delta delta waves and increases and changes the phase alignment just the way other anesthetics do. So it's really curious to me that we're finding the, these very almost eerily identical effects across different anesthetics that all do the same thing: amplify these delta waves and change the way they they move and change the phase alignment. That's interesting. I feel like it's still hard to tell the directionality there. So seeing the reduction in high frequency activity could be because of just an increase in the low frequency, making the high frequency activity out of uh, it, out it of. It could phase, be, right? but I suspect it's going to be. It's more the increase in low power because okay. it's easy for low frequencies to push around high frequencies. Think of like yeah, you know a bunch yeah. of rain dropping on a uh, pond and then a big boat comes through gotcha. so what you see is a big increase in, in the delta power and that's got to be a direct influence of, of the of the increase in delta power alone and then then it's hard to tell whether the loss in the higher frequencies is due to true loss or whether it's due because that's the, what i mean yeah. yeah that that's probably the directionality in which it goes okay, okay. all right thank you sure. thanks for that question cameron um we'll take two more questions and then wrap up. Uh, there's a really good question that I'm actually also um, very interested in from Andy Keller. Uh, let me put you up really quickly. Oh. Hey, uh, thank you for the, the great talk, Earl. Thank you. Andy. I had a question about the mechanism of the beta inhibition, potentially mm -hmm. from like a dynamical systems point of view. Um, and there's a bunch of people here who are way smarter than me. So I'm hoping you can help me answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it, is there any way that this can be understood in terms of like synchronization in a network of coupled oscillators? So if you have this low frequency somehow in training the other rhythms or is there some other mechanism you're thinking of well coupled oscillators is a pretty good bet i refer to the work of like nancy capel for example who's modeled this on, on extensively but when we think of the inhibitory influences of, of beta we, we originally thought of it as just a matter of energy state all over the cortex you see whenever there's a lot of spiking you see gamma when there's less spiking you, you see lower frequencies like like beta so we did thought of it is that what it's doing what beta is doing is basically it's not really inhibit inhibiting neurons it is driving a network into a lower energy state where that's associated with less spiking but now we have new evidence from some of our modeling work and also have new evidence in literature that it's beta rhythms may actually entrain inhibitory neurons specifically so it may actually be a dire direct influence and they saw uh, this popped up from one of the models we, we were working on, but also then doing a literature search, I found there's been a couple of recent examples of this for the past couple of years where people have argued that beta oscillations are particularly activating inhibitory neurons. So it may actually be a direct inhibitory role. That's awesome. Thank you. I think it's awesome too. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so we'll take one last question from Andreas. I'm going to put you up. Oh, 
or probably a couple of questions actually. So. Hello. Hello. Oh, I'm far away from Germany, so it's crossed the ocean. <laughs> ah. um, yes, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. Greetings to Andre Bastos. He's one of the rowing mates from me, from ah. uh, from <laughs> Frankfurt uh, at Pascal Fries Lab. So uh, we we once were together there. Um, oh, Yes, and Wolf Singer as well. Um, I was wondering from, I'm a physicist, uh, also trained um, physiologist, but um, I'm wondering if, from, uh, from this uh, view, I always think that uh, traveling waves are uh, from a physical view, the solution of a wave equation, more or less. And um, the wave equation is somehow then hidden in this uh, recurrency of the network. Um, so what do you think, um, I mean, if, if you, if you disrupt all the recurrency of the network, do you think all the waves are then abolished or can, can we somehow influence like you do with the ketamine, uh, the recurrency of the network? And this mean you, you instantly, uh, stop the wave equation more or less and, um, you have you have no possibility that traveling waves are happening similar when you play the bass uh, the bass and uh, you have a, a, a coupling with your amplifier there's a, also the recurrency is well recurrency is very important in the brain your brain's full of recurrent connections both locally which helps propagate you know, excite neurons and also like long loops seem like the cortex and thalamus as, as i mentioned which helps regulate. I mean, that, that you're the physicist, but that's my guess is that those recurrent connections are playing this important role in generating these oscillations and drip and uh, generating the traveling waves. So I'm with you. I think that's that's uh, that. I mean, I'd, I'd love to do the experiments you're talking about. I'm just not quite sure how. It's yes, nice the funny thing is, yes, I think there the magic happens because um, from physics, um, there is only one solution because of the of the uh, of the wave equation. So if you have a wave equation and if you if you then compute what what is the solution there you have one solution maybe harmonics or something like this so the question is and this is uh, for me very intriguing um the cortex uh, shows up that certain traveling waves happen so there must be a uh, analog to this wave equation of course you have to translate it to there are several requirements that only this wave can can travel you know what i mean it's like a standing wave sometimes you get these funny things in in uh, some water uh, uh, ways where you can see a standing wave or something but there is only one solution it's not that you have a bunch of of waves and um it seems that uh, there's a tuning that only these waves can occur that sounds beautiful. I'd love to hear more. Yes, <laughs> we, should talk. we should talk, you and I. Yes, yes, of course, because then physics comes together with this. Uh, I, I always, oh, there is, there was a physicist, his name is Hermann Haken. I don't know if it's, if he's um, known in, uh, in the US, but he has a kind of, he has developed the laser theory and the laser theory. Pardon? Synergetics. Yes, exactly. Synergetics. And the thing of the laser theory, um, what you can learn from this is that only this wave, this standing wave, um, it's like your, I, I forget the term, epi, epi, where you, the field influences the field more or less. Effective coupling. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't pronounce it. Um, but the same happens in the laser because the laser, the field allows only a certain, um, uh, a certain frequency to happen. Others are, um diminished because of the resonator mm. it's it's totally the same Fantastic. and uh, and this is why Hermann Haken also has his theory about the laser and he, he develops a lot of theory about the brain <laughs> so uh, physics has some common uh, solutions to this 
And what happens in the synergetic is that you, he, he called it the um, slavery mechanism. So mm -hmm. there are um, in complex systems, there is one of, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to say it in, in, in one word, but just to, in an abstract way, he developed a, a theory around these complex systems. And it seems that they are very similar in different physical entities. That's fantastic, Andreas. It's you and I talk um, offline because I'd love—I would love to hear. Yeah, more. sorry. I'm glad to hear. No, I'm, I'm glad to hear. I mean, there should be a connection between physics and the brain, right? So it's good. We're, good. We're approaching one, right? Yes, so yes, let's, yes. Let's you and I talk, please. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I think it's time. I—I uh, unfortunately think it's time to wrap things up to keep keep things on track. Uh, I really enjoyed that Q and A session, and I really enjoyed the talk. Um, so thank you. thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this is exactly what I kind of hoped for with my uh, other organizers for Wave Club that we could, even though traveling wave seemed like a hyper specific area, we can get together on Zoom and there are so many people with different perspectives on things that can find each other over the internet and talk about this particular topic that I think is so interesting. Well, they may um, be specific, but they influence everything. That's right. That, that's, that's, that's why I'm interested. Yeah, you're right. Um, Earl, thank you so much. Um, and just really quickly, um, for those who didn't get to ask their questions, uh, Earl, is there a way that they could contact you or ask if they'd like sure. to? Sure, drop me an email. Cool, great. Um, anyone who's interested, please follow us on uh, on Twitter. We have Wave at, or X or whatever those people call it these days, uh, <laughs> at Wave Club Seminar, right? Yep, all one word. Um, and we'll be back next month with a talk by, uh, by Zach Davis. So thanks again for your attention, Earl. Thanks again. Have a great Thank afternoon, you. everybody, or evening, or whatever time it is for you. Bye-bye. <laughs>